Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to the NERSC data seminar. Uh, we're really excited today to have um, Karen Vahi from the Information Sciences Institute at USC School of Engineering. Uh, Karen is a senior scientist, computer scientist at the Science Automation Technologies Group at the USC Information Sciences, Sciences Institute. Um, he's been working in the field of scientific workflow since 2002 and has been closely involved in the development of the Pegasus workflow management system. He's currently the architect and lead developer for Pegasus as, and is uh, in charge of the core development. He also currently leads the cloud platforms group at CI Compass, um, which is a, an NSF CI center, including practitioners and major NSF uh, facilities. Um, aiming to understand the current practices for cloud infrastructure and um, and research alternative solutions. Um, I So I got to meet uh, Karen because he's also a 2022 uh, BSSW, Better Scientific Software um, Fellowship Fellow, um, and uh, I'm the coordinator. So I was really excited about his work and knew that uh, we should definitely uh, hear about it um, at NERSC. So with that, I'm Give it to you, Karen. Yeah, um, thanks a lot, uh, Hi, for uh, the introduction. And uh, also thank you for making this opportunity available to formally talk about Pegasus workflows. Uh, you know, NERSC has always been an attractive resource for us to remote uh, submit and run some workflows in general. And I'm hoping that today's talk can spark conversations about how to support Pegasus workflows at NERSC uh, better for the general user community. So keeping that in mind, I'm going to structure my talk for about 40, 45 minutes and leaving last 15 minutes for discussion. So, uh, so before I talk about Pegasus, a short preamble about what are scientific workflows. Scientific workflows in general, they conduct a series of computational tasks. Resources can be distributed across the internet. You can chain tasks together. The reason why you want to use scientific workflows is ease of use, ability to give non-developers access to sophisticated codes. It provides a framework to host or assemble community set of applications. And multidisciplinary workflows can even promote uh, broader collaborations. On the right of the slide are simple workflow building blocks. You know, most of the scientific, work, scientific workflows in the community are DAGs. And, you know, the simple graph constructs and using these, you can pretty much create uh, pretty complex workflows. So single jobs can be considered a workflow, series of jobs producing some outputs and then a merge step, uh, is one uh, popular pattern, splitting the large input data set and working on it in parallel or running things in sequence, all those are simple examples of scientific workflows. So given there is this thing as scientific workflows, why would a user consider using Pegasus uh, to manage their workflows? So Pegasus allows automation of complex uh, multi-stage processing pipelines it enables parallel and distributed computations. One of the key tenets of Pegasus is the data management aspect. So it does automatically execute data transfers for your workflows. Uh, the description of in which you describe your Pegasus workflows is a reusable description. It aids reproducibility. Uh, Pegasus does a fairly good job in recording how the data is produced, especially the runtime provenance of the data. Uh, we handle failures uh, with automatic job retries uh, to provide reliability, and Pegasus does keep track of data and files and also ensures data integrity. So Pegasus itself is a close, it's an MSF-funded project since 2001 with close collaboration with the HT content. So in general, uh, you know, some workflow challenges which people encounter across domains irrespective of work workflow systems uh, you are using is you want to be able to describe your workflows in a simple way and then be able to access distributed heterogeneous data and resources. 
you need to be able to also deal with this notion of that resources and software change over time. And by that, I mean the underlying middleware. Uh, if you're running large workflows, uh, whether you're able to easily debug and monitor them and overall ease of use. So within Pegasus, uh, you know, we've had a clear focus on what our strengths are. So one of the things which we focused on it, since inception is like a clear demarcation between the workflow description and workflow execution. So in Pegasus, there's a notion of a workflow planning step, which compiles your workflow for your target execution resource. As your tasks get executed, we do monitor how they uh, are running and grab and capture a lot of provenance data, which we make available to our users via a series of command line tools and a web dashboard. And We've also done a lot of work recently to provide additional assurances that the scientific workflow is not accidentally or maliciously tampered with during its execution. So Pegasus will check some, all the data sets that are created for your work, uh, as your workflows uh, run. So as I mentioned, you know, it's been, uh, Pegasus has been around for quite some time. So some success stories, old and new, uh, so one of the biggest users of Pegasus is at uh, University of Southern California uh, in the Southern California Earthquake uh, Center. So there they do a CyberShake application where they try to generate a hazard map for the whole of California now. So these workflows are a mix of MPI single code jobs with a mix of CPU and GPU codes. Uh, so we've been supporting them since 2005. Uh, SCEC usually has been on the forefront of using national CI resources from TerraGrid to Exceed and now Access. And they are also a heavy user of POE resources at ORNL. Uh, we've done some work to get some SCEC codes running at Permluter in the past uh, year or so. Uh, another big user of Pegasus is LIGO, where they run a one of the biggest pipelines for gravitational wave detections, which is a high throughput computing workload uh, using Pegasus on Open Science Grid and uh, LIGO's uh, own clusters. So we've been working with LIGO since 2001. Uh, Xenon MP, which is another astronomy project for dark matter search, they have been uh, using Pegasus since 2009. So as I mentioned, you know, like uh, SCIC uh, workflows are a traditional HPC workflows where there's a healthy mix of uh, single core jobs, but they're predominantly multi-core jobs, um, uh, MPI, and they end up running, uh, doing these studies every year where they're attempting to build more detailed hazard maps uh, for the California region in general. And these hazard maps are of great use to USGS and uh, the insurance industry in California. So it's a, it has a definite uh, scientific uh, pickup uh, as a result of what's uh, created. So depending on where they're running, uh, so this is a, a slide I made a couple of years back. So I need to update it, but you know, one of the runs was done on Titan and Blue Waters, where uh, Blue Waters uh, was doing a more, most of the post-processing jobs, uh, single core jobs, and at Titan, uh, Skip was running uh, uh, their parallel jobs, and uh, they were using Pegasus to run these workflows across both the two systems. Uh, as I mentioned, LIGO, uh, LIGO is on the other end of the spectrum where their workflows are mainly high throughput uh, computing workflows, and they have set them up to run in a completely distributed fashion on Open Science Grid and other resources which are captured uh, from uh, their own captive LIGO clusters. So they use a combination of pilot jobs, which are managed by Glide and WMS on OSG and uh, run these workflows. So the LIGO workflows have complicated data movements just because of the target uh, uh, execution environments distributed setup. And 
they use Pegasus to seamlessly do the, do the data transfer for their workflows, leverage all the caches uh, where uh, necessary. Uh, Event Horizon uh, Telescope uh, also has uh, some pipelines running through Pegasus. It's uh, been funded out of like uh, the OSG work. So they run pipelines on Open Science Grid again. And the Pegasus Simba pipeline is incorporated into Cyverse, which is a higher level workflow uh, coordination uh, or a gateway to. And then uh, recently in the past one year, uh, we worked with the USC HPC cluster where they run a big slow cluster and USC recently got uh, delivery of cryo EM microscopes. So these are, this is electron microscopy and we've worked with them to build a system that automatically does data processing using Pegasus of all the data that is coming out of these microscopes. So, workflows get launched in real time as uh, new data sets or uh, new images are acquisitioned uh, through these microscopes. And, uh, you know, on the NIH side, uh, uh, there is a big uh, um, center called NIMH, which is, stands for National Institute of uh, Medical Health. So they have a repository in the G genomics resource uh, called NRGR. And there we, Pegasus is used to curate uh, data sets that are submitted by various psychiatric uh, uh, researchers. So as part of that, uh, there's a web interface where the various um, NIH researchers from universities all over the US and worldwide submit the phenotypic data sets for curation and harmonization. So again, like uh, the processing is built on top of Pegasus there. So in terms of uh, basic concepts, and um, I just wanted to mention, I'm not keeping a lookout on the Zoom chat. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them as they come or in the end, whatever people prefer. So some key co uh, Pegasus concepts. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, you know, Pegasus maps workflows to infrastructure. So Pegasus uh, uses uh, Condor Dagman uh, as our workflow executor. So Pegasus will take a high level description of your workflow and translate in, into a Condor Dagman description that can then be run, uh, that uh, submitted and run on your resources. In Pegasus, workflows are DAGs. By DAGs, we mean directed acyclic graph of tasks. So nodes indicate jobs, edges indicate dependencies. The dependencies can be control flow or data flow. We don't support while loops or conditional branches out of the box. Uh, jobs are standalone executables. So that's the only requirement. Uh, in Pegasus, planning occurs ahead of execution. I will get into it in my coming slides. So the thing, the way to think about this planning process is like a workflow compiler. So it takes this high level description and generates an executable workflow that can actually be executed on your resource. So what do we mean by that? So on the left, I have uh, the, a portable description, which is like uh, the Pegasus input specification, which now is YAML formatted. And there a user describes to Pegasus what tasks they want to be executed. For each task, they refer to the task with logical identifiers or transformations, which help Pegasus identify what executables to invoke when a particular task runs. For each task, a user describes their input and output data sets, which are represented as files. And again, with these, when they're describing these uh, data sets, they use logical identifiers for it. So if you were to think about it, this description is very similar to what you would discuss with your colleague on a whiteboard when describing your pipeline. You, you don't worry about any of the execution details, you just sketch out or describe how your comp computations look like. 
and what arguments each task needs to be um, invoked with. So when you give this high level description to Pegasus and you say to Pegasus, I want to run my workflows on these clusters, what Pegasus will do is it will look up certain data catalogs to figure out where your data sets reside and then automatically annotate the underlying tag with additional jobs in the workflow. So some of the jobs which we add uh, for the workflow are oriented around data management. So we'll add, add in data staging jobs to stage in your data sets, uh, clean up jobs that automatically clean up data from the scratch space on the shared file systems or staging areas as the workflow is executing. And then as your outputs is created, uh, there are data stage out jobs that will uh, transfer the outputs to a server of your choosing and a registration job which can catalog those outputs back into our data catalogs. So at a high level, like the way you think about as a user on how to use Pegasus is you'd say to Pegasus that, you know, I have a workflow that I want to run on particular set of execution resources and I want my inputs uh, to be picked up from one place and outputs to be placed on uh, as the workflow is. So to do this mapping, uh, what sort of information Pegasus requires? So Pegasus will refer to three catalogs. And again, these catalogs in the most default uh, configuration are YAML formatted files. So a replica catalog is a simple mapping which describes where your data sets are stored. So it's LFN, PFN mapping. By LFN, we mean logical file names. PFN is physical file names like the paths to your data sets and on what clusters or sites those data sets exist. Transformation catalog allows a user to describe your executables as to what architecture they are compiled for, where they reside, whether they need to be executed using an application container and so forth. And then the site catalog describes your execution resource. So, you know, for example, in case of NERSC, when people are running uh, their workflows, they'll have a code site, which will basically describe what are the servers they can use for data transfers and what are the uh, directories that can be used for job execution. Hey, Karen. Uh, um... yes. Could you uh, give Pegasus information about potential resources if they are queried to be available? Like, you know, I would like the workflow to run ideally on resource X, but if it's not available, then to try Y or Z? I think like, so that falls out of the place, for example, in Open Science Grid, where, uh, for example, in Open Science Grid, we are running pilot jobs or like not like the end Pegasus user, but the Open Science Grid uh, community, they look at the job queues and then launch pilots. And then they overlay a Condor pool in case of um, uh, Open Science Grid and using what workers spin up and are available, uh, you can do that. Okay. So as I mentioned, uh, in terms of like uh, tools to generate this abstract workflow, you know, Pegasus now provides a very powerful, simple, easy to use uh, Python 3 workflow API where you can describe your jobs. And out here, I have a simple hello world example, like two jobs specified, a parent and a dependent job. So I specify that I'm creating a workflow. It requires, there's a file called web page. I have a curl job, some arguments, and I add outputs. There's a count job that counts the number of lines in the job. You can connect them together to dependencies and write it out. And if you look at this description, it's also fairly easy to you uh, read and reason about for, uh, anybody. So everything is being identified by logical identifiers, similar to our analogy of like, you know, 
you describe your, your workflows in a similar way to how you would describe a workflow to your colleague on a whiteboard. So Pegasus 5.0, uh, we released it a couple of years back and that was a big uh, undertaking at our end where you know, we decided to focus heavily on a Python 3 interface for uh, users to describe their workflows. So Python, the Python 3 Pegasus uh, API is complete in terms of like, it allows you to compose workflows, submit them, monitor them, configure all the catalogs. Uh, all Pegasus tools are Python 3 compliant. Uh, in the default case where you're just trying to run your workflows on your local desktop or a laptop, uh, there's zero configuration required. And we did a lot of data management improvements and also reworked our documentation and the tutorial, which uh, can be accessed from the Pegasus website. So in general, uh, what does a pe standard Pegasus deployment look like? So in Pegasus, there is a notion of a workflow submit node. So that is usually like a workflow login node where both Pegasus and Condor get installed. And that is the node from where users submit their workflows for execution. You can submit your workflows to run on one or more compute sites. Compute sites in Pegasus generally align well with clusters at a high level. So if you have different clusters, you could refer to them as different compute sites. Or you know, when you're running in open science grid, you know, the pilots are grabbing resources from multi like tens or hundreds of clusters, and there's one uh, global uh, condor pool that has been created. Users have an option of distributing their input data sets at multiple servers. So you know, your input data sets don't need to be co-located with where your jobs are going to be run. Pegasus will take care of the data transfers. Depending on the configuration in which you are running your workflows, their Pegasus has a notion of a data staging site, which is used to store the intermediate data products for your workflows. If you're running in a pure HPC environment, let's say on Cori, uh, you can use the shared file system as your data staging site. So basically like depending on what configuration you are running in, you can move these pieces uh, and have them co-located if required. And an output site is a site where you want the generated data products to be made available as your workflows run. So going back to the original uh, statement I said, I have a workflow, I need to run it on one or more compute sites and these are my servers to use. Um, also like as uh, jobs run, uh, the default distributed case, all jobs get wrapped by lightweight Pegasus light instances, which when a job starts up on a worker node, figures out uh, what directory on the worker node a job needs to run and how to pull in the data sets just for that particular job. As uh, if there's any checksums to be done, it does, it confirms checksums, generates the outputs, and then pushes them to the data staging site and things get cleaned up. So at the Pegasus end, we do make a lot of effort on the data cleanup part because we do realize that users are, sometimes they forget or don't care enough about uh, the scratch file system space. So we do uh, have these data cleanup uh, nodes at the various points to clean up as your jobs uh, finish. So in terms of uh, a higher level architecture as to how Pegasus gets deployed in multiple uh, uh, user communities. So a lot of our users also do interface with Pegasus directly using our APIs. So we do have uh, APIs in Java, R, and Python with the Python one being most widely used and now the most complete one in terms of uh, allowing you to uh, submit, monitor your workflows and so forth. Pegasus is also incorporated into workflow gateways such as Hub Zero, Cybers. 
uh, science gateways and portals such as on de open on demand that's something which i'll get down get into a bit more detail as part of uh, the new access program which is the successor to exceed where uh, pegasus uh, has a small part in the support part and uh, through Pegasus, you can run your workflows on campus clusters, local clusters, open science grid access resources. You can set up your workflows to run in cloud environments, and you can use a variety of uh, different mechanisms in how you retrieve your data. So from an uh, end user perspective, Pegasus does also make a user dashboard available, which allows users to monitor their workflow executions, status shows the status of the workflows, jobs, and it is a drill down dashboard. So you have a home page where you see all your workflows running, it's color coded, blue indicates a workflow is running, red indicates failure, green indicates success. And then you can click on a workflow, look at all the jobs and drill down on each job to get further details. And we also provide uh, useful statistics uh, for the whole workflow when your workflow is complete. So this allows you to debug and troubleshoot. We also have a REST API available for to query your provenance uh, information if people want to integrate it uh in a high level uh, web api uh the same set of information is available made available to the users through our command line tools so all the information gets populated into a sqlite database at runtime in your workflow submit directory so you can run commands such as pegasus status which will give you the status of your job if something goes wrong and your workflow fails, you can run Pegasus Analyzer, which will tell you what jobs failed and why they failed. Uh, there is a, a command called Pegasus Statistics, which is very useful for our end users to estimate uh, the usage requirements for the workflows. So it tells you workflow wall times, how much CPU hours did you use, and so forth. And also a breakdown of jobs succeeded, failed, and detailed information about every job so when you're running uh, your workflows in a distributed environments failures are bound to happen so in pegasus all jobs are uh, associated with job retries so that helps with transient failures uh, you can set the number of retries per job uh, by default we set it to two retries uh, if you know, after retrying the job, your workflow still uh, fails, we end up creating a rescue tag, which allows you to resubmit the workflow from where you left off. And that's pretty useful. Let's say you have a long running workflow and your cluster goes down for maintenance. So your workflow will eventually fail, but then you can submit the rescue tag. If your jobs uh, generate checkpoint files, then you know, you have an option to mark your uh, files as checkpoint files, and then on job retries, we do make the checkpoint file available, the last checkpoint file available on the job retry. And then a postscript gets associated by with each job, which allows us to reliably detect looking at the job logs of what the exact code was. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, Pegasus does have a small part in Access. So it's a part of the access support strategy. So the vision is that Pegasus will be used as a tier one tool where in conjunction with open on demand, we are going to uh, have access resources available to access users to run their workflows. And we have a central open on demand instance that is configured with Pegasus, HT Condor, and Jupyter Notebooks. And we have created training materials uh, for the end user community to log into this uh, submit node and submit their workflows to the various access clusters. So that endpoint is known as access.pegasus.isi.edu and it's using motion of pilot jobs. So instead of the user logging into each of the access resources, 
They log into the central node, submit their workflows and launch pilots from the various access resources. And you can launch pilots from multiple access resources at the same time and create a overlay condor pool. And then depending on the job uh, that are in your queue and what nodes are available, jobs will get uh, mapped to run on various access resources. So that goes back to uh, Hai's original question a couple of minutes back about how would you want to try running workflows on multiple clusters uh, dependent on availability. So for access, one of the things which we are leveraging is a relatively new tool out of HD Condor called Annex, which allows you to easily launch pilot jobs against national CI resources. And the way the pilots get set up is that they are partitionable. So job slots get dynamically created based on resource requirements of the user jobs. That means you can fit multiple user jobs on a compute node at the same time, which is very important in case of, let's say, HTC workflow workloads also, right? Because at the national CI end, the nodes are getting beefier and your codes may not all be MPI. Uh, a key point which I want to highlight is like the way the pilots are going to be set up and match, they only run jobs for the user who started it. And that is keeps in account to job accounting and also permissions. So some Pegasus features, which I will briefly go into. So as I mentioned, you know, data management is one of the key things which Pegasus does really well. And one of the reasons why we are able to work in such a diverse set of environments is that we have our own data transfer tool called Pegasus Transfer, which has a support for a number of different protocols. And we have this notion of one tool, one tool that rules all. So using this tool, we create directories for the jobs, we remove files, we can do two-stage transfers. So let's say you're running your workflows in a cloud environment where you would want to use S3 as your data staging site, but your input data sets might be in grid FTP. We can allow users to run in this configuration. We'll just do the two-stage transfer internally, bring down the data sets locally from a grid FTP server, and then push them to S3 and vice versa, for example. Uh, Pegasus Transfer has a notion of parallel transfers, automatic retries, credential management. Uh, this is not a complete exhaustive list of uh, protocols we support, but all the major protocols are supported and it's very easy to add support for newer protocols. So in terms of data staging configurations, depending on what your execution environment is, uh, Pegasus workflows can be run in different modes. So the, with Pegasus 5.0, we changed our default data configuration to be a pure distributed computing uh, setup, such as a co local ponder pool or open science grid. So there we use leverage internal condor built file transfer protocols to transfer the data sets. So the workers just get launched on the various resources and your jobs, when they start, they can pull in data uh, from the submit host uh, using uh, Condor file I.O. A more general version of this is the non-shared file system setup, which can be used in a cloud environment or open science grid, where you can use, for example, in clouds, like S3 as your data staging area. So when your workflows run, Pegasus will create a bucket, uh, use a bucket or create a bucket uh, if it doesn't exist or your data staging and push your outputs uh, as they're created into that and also bring in the inputs to that. In the traditional HPC environment where there's a shared file system available across all the nodes, uh, you know, the data staging site uh, translates to the shared file system. So the IO happens directly against the shared file system. So this is uh, another, high level picture of like, 
If you're running in a HPC environment on a HPC cluster, you can use the shared file system for your input data site, data staging site, and output data sites. In cloud computing, like the various nodes, they have remote access to object storage and Pegasus uh, make sure the data sets get pulled down uh, to your worker node in the cloud when a job starts. And in a traditional grid environment, which now uh, only like open science grid is a true dominant of, uh, we use uh, uh, inbuilt condor file transfer mechanisms or you know separate data staging servers, for example, LIGO relies on it. Also, uh, in Pegasus, we do have a tool called Pegasus MPI cluster, which allows users to run large fine-grained workflows on HPC systems. So what that allows us to do is that you can have a workflow composed of thousands of tasks, which are all single core, but when they are run on a HPC resource, Pegasus translates the part of the workflow into a or the whole workflow into an MPI job, which can be run using Pegasus MPI cluster. So it runs the tasks internally in a simple master worker paradigm. So that allows us to fit fine grained workflows onto HPC systems. Uh, Pegasus does have good support for containers uh, in terms like of uh, you know, users have an option of specifying in the transformation catalog a container in which they want their jobs to run in. Uh, there are a variety of ways they can use containers. They can refer to container they want to use. And Pegasus will just stage in their executables into the container. So let's say like, you know, you have a base container that you want to use for all your jobs. You can do that and then Pegasus will stage in your uh, executables into the container. Or you can also tell Pegasus that my codes are already packaged into an application container, which is what I want to use when my job runs. Internally on a node, when a job lands up, uh, Pegasus will automatically pull the image, start the container, mount whatever directories are required, set the job environment, stage in the inputs, execute your code, stage out the output, stop the container and clean up. So in terms of uh, support, so does Pegasus supports Docker, Singularity, and Shifter? So all three are supported. Uh, what Pegasus does is it treats containers as an input data dependency. So, you know, containers are like any other input data set a job requires. They can be staged to compute nodes if they are not present. Our users can use, uh, images which are populated into Docker Singularity Hubs. Internally, what Pegasus does is, if you describe a in, uh, image uh, in a, a Docker Hub or a Singularity Hub, you know, as part one of the steps in the workflow, it gets exported as a tar file, and then just gets uh, moved around like any other input data sets. And this helps us to scale up for larger workflows as let's say like if you're using the same image for all of your jobs in the workflow, we'll pull the image once. And that has pricing considerations since now Docker Hub uh, does charge if you exceed a certain rate of pulls from the hubs. There are optimizations in terms of containers. Uh, you can symlink against existing images on shared file systems such as EFMS and so forth. On terms of performance, uh, Pegasus has a notion of job clustering. So that allows us to fit jobs better. I mentioned one way is like using the PMC tool, or you can also cluster jobs, uh, short running jobs together, and they get launched on a remote node uh, in a sequential fashion, but you do optimize on the scheduling delays. Uh, Pegasus, can scale up to hundreds of thousands of uh, jobs in a workflow. In fact, uh, like, you know, the large scale LIGO workflows for uh, the production workflows, they are easily above hundreds of thousands of jobs. And they also leverage a concept known as uh, hi hierarchical workflows, where a job in the workflow can be another workflow itself. 
So that allows them to connect different pipelines together uh, and do a production run in one go. Uh, so as I mentioned at the start of my presentation, their Pegasus, when you describe a workflow, you tell it what data sets each of your job requires. So that means that we can also do data reuse, where like if your job's output is already in an output data catalog, we can reason about it at the graph level and prune out jobs that are no longer required. So do a full flow reduction and run a subset of your workflow. Uh, uh, Pegasus also allows users to uh, annotate metadata about their data sets, which then we record in a provenance catalog and make it available to the user through the workflow dashboard or uh, Pegasus metadata, a command line tool. And there we get information collected from various sources. And one of the recent uh, work which we have done in the past couple of years is about scientific data integrity. So modern IT systems are not perfect, errors creep in. At the large big data sizes, we have started to see checksums break down. There can be threat of intentional changes. A lot of times users perceive that they may be already protected by TCP checksums, encrypted transfers, and so forth. But when you are running in a distributed environment, as a user, you don't know whether all the data staging uh, ops are protected or not. So within Pegasus, we have built in automatic integrity checking where you know, users can specify their checksums in our input file catalogs. If they don't specify checksums, we compute checksums on the first pull of the data. As your data sets get generated, we checksum them and then catalog those checksums in our catalogs. And whenever a data set gets pulled down to a worker node, we do match the checksums. And if a um, checksum doesn't match, then we trigger a failure and a job retry. So that just comes out of the box uh, for Pegasus users. And that sort of brings me to the end of this presentation where uh, you know some useful information about how to get started with Pegasus. Uh, we have a variety of support channels available, uh, users mailing list, dedicated support mail list. A lot of our users now do use Slack. So you can request and invite to try to join Pegasus users slack.com in Slack app. Uh, we have a YouTube channel and we also have a Pegasus in five minutes video. And we do have office hours uh, every couple of months to uh, address user questions and apprise the community of uh, new developments. And uh, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Karen, that was great. So uh, there are some questions that have already formed in uh, the chat. So uh, Chris, if you wanna unmute yourself, you're more than welcome to ask them directly or I can ask them for you. Thanks so much, yeah, I was. Um, I had basically just two questions. Uh, first one was you, you talked about checkpointing support. Yes. Um, and I'm curious, how do you know whether the application the user is trying to run in that job supports checkpointing in the first place? So we don't know, and that's a good point. I, as I mentioned, you know, like when you describe your workflow, so you describe your input data sets and your output data sets, mm -hmm. and there you have an option to tag a file for a job as a checkpoint file. And then what Pegasus does is if a job fails, and the file that you mentioned is a checkpoint file, then it has slightly different semantics on the data lifecycle for that particular file. Yep. We make it available on the next retry. Okay, great. Oh, thank you. Um, and the second one was, was around containers. Um, how easy is it to add support for new container runtimes in there? Like, I mean, example from my point of view is Podman. Yeah, so I think, uh, so originally we started with Docker and Singularity, then we put in support for Shifter. Mm -hmm. So within the Pegasus planner, we have 
uh, you know, abstracted out our internal interfaces to allow us to put in support. And then there's some support that goes into Pegasus Lite. Overall, I think like our core interfaces support addition of new technologies. We just haven't gotten around to using Portman yet. And one of the reasons for that has been that like in a non-HPC user base, which mainly ends up running on Open Science Grid, they tend to use Singularity a lot. But the way we have designed our container support, it is possible. Great. Well, thank you. Right. So, uh, Nick, Tyler, you want to ask your question? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I noticed that. So, I'm a little bit familiar with um, Condor and stuff like that and uh, starting up a pool. So, do most of your users, are they using like open science grid resources or resources that already have a pool? Or so, how are they managing yeah. their own pools? So, I was hoping somebody would ask that question. So, one of the things which I want to really clarify about Pegasus dependency on Condor is that Pegasus by default is using Condor as a submit, as a way to submit jobs. So what that means is, so let's say you have your own local HPC cluster. So for example, in case of NERSC and Cori, you only need to install Pegasus and Condor on a workflow login node where right. we have access to Slurm hmm. so that Condor can submit jobs to Slurm. So in that case, even though there is a Condor queue that gets uh, made available to the users on the login node, it is no longer, no, not at all hijacking your resources. So the jobs get scheduled by Slurm in the end. And most of our users, it's true, like they like to use Open Science Grid, but we have a lot of users who are also running their workflows on their local HPC clusters for example, at USC, and there, you know, USC has a Sloan cluster. They just deployed Pegasus and, and Condor on one of their login nodes and users submit their workflows from there. So my hope is that, you know, this uh, presentation starts hopefully a discussion with relevant NERSC sysadmins to convince them to you know, make a workflow login node available where, you know, Pegasus and Condor can be made available to the users. So, so I guess, yeah, the, the question though is, does Condor itself then request uh, resources from Slurm? Uh, so or there are two more. Use... Yeah, so in okay. this, the, like when I went through my access slides, yes, that's how that would be. But uh, the way to think about it in a, default HPC cluster case would be a push, right? Like, so the workflow is running through Condor, there are jobs, those jobs need to be run on Slurm, some uh, resources. Condor internally does, just does a S batch command to submit the job and that's it. Okay. So it just, so all the jobs then, you know, eventually end up uh, appearing in the Slurm queue. Okay. Now, one of the big advantages which we have noticed uh, based on our users' feedback, when they run on local Slurm clusters is, you know, we can run workflows with thousands of tasks. You try to run a workflow in thousands of tasks and dump all those jobs in a Slurm queue, often that creates a lot of issues. But that's not an issue uh, at our end because, you know, you, we can control how many jobs get submitted to Slurm at any given time in line with user policies. So there are those knobs that, uh, that allow you to do that. Cool. Thank you. So kind of building on that, can I ask, um, you know, so what is the, I guess, uh, to deploy Pegasus, it seems that you're saying the requirement is to have a, a workflow uh, submit node. Um, so, what are the requirements around kind of deploying that? And then, um, uh, yeah, so, I, you know, yes, I, I guess Florm sure. is one too, right? So. Yeah, so for both Pegasus and Condor, there are RPM packages mm -hmm. available. So in a, literally it's yum installed for two packages and that should be it. Uh, so, you know, thing to keep in mind is like Pegasus itself runs into user space. 
Uh, but since Condor is also like has its demons, etc., so Condor does do user switching. So Condor needs to be started as root through the system CTL standard practices, like the same way you would run Apache or anything else. But so so, but uh, I guess. Um... Since Pegasus can reach out to multiple clusters, it, it's just the one uh, submit node that needs to have Condor um, and Pegasus yeah. installed. Otherwise, you know, yeah. so could I, yeah, I could have just done it. Yeah, so, you know, for example, when our users are running on Open Science Grid, right? Mm -hmm. So Open Science Grid is being formed by uh, resources from various clusters. Those clusters don't have Pegasus installed. Right. Uh, you know, Pegasus, the lightweight worker package gets deployed at runtime. Got and, it. Yeah. Okay. Bill? Yes. Uh, how much work would it be to create a new executor that submits using a REST API designed to interface and schedule HPC resources? Yeah. So I was expecting this question. I think, like, so. If we want to seamlessly support that, uh, then you know we need support in a layer of Condor called Condor Gap. So that's the layer that deals with submitting jobs to other job schedulers and so forth. So one way to go down that road would be to make a case to the Condor development team to put in support in the Gap layer to use a new protocol to submit jobs. So they do it, uh, they've done it in the past, but they mainly do it based on what, uh, you know, like how much the demand is for that. And like the way I framed my answer, that does not get rid of Condor for you directly. Because if, you know, like, Pegasus does build on top of Condor. There's, we have a lot of like our, you know, provenance information, all the monitoring stuff built on top of that. So, you know, as a proof of concept use case, we could remove that dependency, but it won't give a complete user experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next question, uh, Zhenji. Oh, yes. Um, I have a question about um, how many tasks. So in your uh, slide, you showed um, Pegasus can handle like uh, hundreds, thousands of tasks. I suppose yeah. you mean those are uh, either simultaneously or kind of lined up tasks. Mm -hmm. So I want to know like uh, within Slurm system, do you know like any example of, I mean, how many S runs you were able to run and uh, run smoothly? So, uh, yeah, so when I say number of tasks, I refer to number of tasks in the workflow. So which means number of tasks in the underlying graph. So that's very like end user specific in terms of how many jobs run at any given time, because, you know, a job can only be released when all the parent jobs have succeeded successfully. So, for example, like uh, if I were to go back and go back to LIGO, so in LIGO for the production runs, you know, they're running hierarchical workflows with, and each of the sub workflow has, I would say around 70 to 90,000 jobs. And then sometimes they use job clustering in Pegasus to reduce the number of jobs that get submitted to SRUN, or like uh, picking up on your analogy or they can be individual subjects. But, you know, again, like the whole reason about workflows is that, you know, your workflow wall time and your whole workflow uh, CPU time, they scale up in a different way. So, you know, your workflow wall time relatively remain short, but if you have a lot of resources available, you can get a lot of work done based on the inherent parallelism exposed by your workflow structure. 
Yeah, okay, sorry, I have uh, one more question. So I think uh, you had some example show on like, uh, you know, Oak Ridge machines and something like that. Then I wonder, we all live in a certain like a batch limit. So when certain, the marks allow the time, yes. you know, bias. Yeah. To, so, I mean, I, I want to know how many human time will be involved with those failed job because of the work time. So, you know, that goes back to my earlier question, like where, you know, like having the condor cube proves useful. So we are able to control, like as a user, specify that how many jobs we need submitted to a particular slurm resource at a time or not, right? So your workflow, you can launch your workflow with 100,000 tasks, but let's say like, you know, that on a particular cluster, the enforcement is only five or 10 jobs can be running per user at a given time. We can set that configuration in Condor. So even though the jobs will be ready to run in the Condor queue, they will not be submitted to Slurm for execution. So for example, like when Skek runs on OLCF resources, they are cognizant of that. So they, and you know, like depending on what their workflow structure is, Sometimes they use pilot jobs or sometimes they use a push based mechanism where, you know, job directly gets submitted to slow. And then, you know, in terms of the automation, like the jobs don't have a hard failure because they get configured in such a way that, you know, the lim job limits are not exceeded, like the number of jobs, you know, per user in a slow. <laughs> Thank you for the answer. Yeah. Great. So we're reaching the top of the hour. Um, and I think there's, you know, certainly more discussion we had. To, uh, if there are any last questions, we can address them or we can also take this offline and um, have some additional questions about some of the more harder requirements and how this actually gets deployed. Um, I'd yeah. be happy to set up something. Yes. Have and, you know, if, uh, people want to get a flavor of like how you can run workflows on access resources uh, in my slides. And I'll share my slides with the uh, high also access.pegasus.isi.edu. You know, you can log in with your exceed single sign on uh, credentials and uh, try out workflows if you want. That would be great. And, Thanks you know, so much. Oh, Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and like from our end, I think like Perm Tutor is a very attractive resource at NERSC that's coming up. For example, you know, Skeg did reach out to us a couple of months back to see if they could use Perm Tutor. So, you know, there's definite interest at our end to use NERSC resources. And I feel like we can get Pegasus and Condor installed at one of the nodes, I think that would be a big win. Wonderful. Yes, we'll make the slides available through the data seminar uh, site. And thank you so much again for the, the talk and we'll be following up on further thank discussion. You. Thank you, Hyde. Thank you. It was nice talking to all of you. Bye-bye.